snow flying in this morning, but I know some of you are trying to get out of town for the holidays before the snow hits in the Midwest. So um, take a look, pull out the message notes in the middle of the outline. They aren't that extensive this week. But want to look at what Paul has to say on this issue. Paul is writing from a jail in a city called Philippi. He's writing this church that he loves so much. Here's what Paul says. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation. Now underline that phrase, every situation. Paul wasn't joking. In every situation, by prayer and thanks, uh, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, out in the margins, if you've got room, where Paul says finally, that, that translation literally means most importantly. Does that make sense? So read it like this. Most importantly, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. You track them with Paul? Paul's talking about you've got these struggles, you've got these things, you make the request known to God, but the good things that come in our life, think about these things. Because whatever you have heard or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Uh, how many of you would like, during this holiday season, uh, to have a little more peace? There in your notes, underline where it says God of peace. That's going to kind of be very, very important to the conversation we're sharing this morning. Here's why. Having that peace that we wouldn't mind having going into the holiday season starts with very basic biblical understanding that you are in control of your own attitude. Good, bad, or indifferent, regardless of the circumstances in your life, which could be good, bad, or indifferent, you are in total control of your attitude. How I many you know there are a lot of things you can't control in life? Lots of things you can't control, right? That's why the, the next line there in your note says attitude is everything. Attitude is absolutely everything. Because the greatest things that happen in your life happen because you have chosen to adopt the right attitude. Every problem, every frustration, whatever it is in your life will get worse if you have an improper attitude, if you have a poor attitude. Attitude is everything. You understand you can't control all the situations, all the circumstances in your life, correct? You just can't do it. You can't change some of your circumstances. For instance, you can't change the political climate in Washington, right? You can't change the weather in Phoenix in July and August. Is that correct? You can't change the Cardinals defense today as much as you'd like to, right? Not bad on the other side of the ball, got to work on this side. But you can't change that today, can you? You can't do it. But here's what you can do. You can choose today before you walk out these doors to change your attitude. I'm going to walk you through three attitudes that will make a huge difference in your life. And every single one of them, every single one of them is 100% biblical. Aren't you glad you're a part of a church that actually believes in the Bible? Every single one of them. So let's jump in. Number one is this. Gratitude makes you strong. The attitude, gratitude is the attitude that builds your strength. That's what Paul is saying in verse 6 when he says, in every situation, and then he says, with thanksgiving. Paul doesn't say with bitterness. He doesn't say, in every situation, as you judge others. Right? Paul says, in every situation, with, talk to me. Thanksgiving. Three of you are here. That's a good morning. <laughs> With Thanksgiving. Now here's why. Here's why Paul says this. For the next six to seven minutes, this is one of the things I love about Scripture. It's one of the things that gets me, drives me to delve into God's Word and try and bring it to you on a weekly basis. The next six to seven minutes are pivotal. And why I do what I do and what we, why we practice around here, what we practice, and it's this. When Paul says, with thanksgiving, here's why. Gratitude is a healthy emotion. And gratitude is healthy. 
You ever wonder why somebody that asks say gratitude is healthy? There's a lot of stuff going on. Why is gratitude healthy? Here's why. It's not in your notes, you can write in the margin. The spirit of gratitude makes you stronger on the inside. I have this major, not conviction, I have this major belief that everything that science discovers has already been discussed in the Bible. Science just hasn't caught up. If you think about it, every, every new discovery in paleontology, every new discovery in uh, the environmental digs, everything, every major study in medicine and emotions are already discussed in the Bible. Science is just catching up, and the further science catches up, the more science proves the Bible. Let me give you an instance. That statement that I just made about uh, Thanksgiving and gratitude actually make you emotionally healthy? I have here a study I downloaded in research for this conversation this morning about how gratitude is everything. As a matter of fact, my connection group that meets this afternoon has already been emailed, emailed this. We're going to talk about it, and here's why. It's a study done about 18 months ago by the University of California at Berkeley. Not necessarily a Christian institution. But I will say this, it is a heavy research institution. Is that fair? Yes. That's fair. And in this study, they talk about the importance of having a spirit of thanksgiving, an attitude of gratitude, and the emotional effects that it has in your life. They say this study, and they quote other studies, in fact, I got all caught up in the rabbit trail. You guys ever get sucked into the vortex of online stuff? Next thing you know, six hours later, it feels like, like six minutes. I got sucked into that. But in this study, uh, what they say is this spirit of thanksgiving, gratitude, when you add that into your men mentality, it literally changes you. Here's what the study asserts. It asserts that when you start practicing the words of gratitude, that creates within you emotions of gratitude, and it is the emotions of gratitude that actually change your brain chemistry. Think about what they're saying. If you're expressing emotion of gratitude through the words of gratitude, it changes your brain chemistry, which then changes your uh, understanding, which then changes your behavior. Now think about how we might practice this. The Bible already teaches us to practice this. What if we practice this in our marriage? How many of our marriages would be healthier when we, because we express gratitude instead of bitterness or resentment? Does the Bible teach that? Science is catching up, right? What about our jobs and our careers? When we go into the office on Monday morning, if we go in with a certain perspective, a certain attitude of appreciation, that while I, I may not be living the dream, I've got a job that pays me decent money, that provides me half decent benefits, and allows me to provide for my family, instead of going every day when my boss is a jerk and I can't stand my coworkers and people gossip everybody but me. Doesn't the Bible teach one over the other? What about how we approach this in our prayer lives? If we always go to God and say, Dear God, or Dear Santa Claus, here's my wishes. Would you, would you, would you give me, give me, give me? Or God, uh, my life sucks and here's why. And you proclaim all the troubles. Not that there's not a place for some of that. But what about if we start in every prayer expressing adoration and gratitude to God for the air we breathe, for the life we have, for His goodness in our lives, that there's a, a, a place for me that the Father has prepared and then get into the needs. How's that going to affect our prayer life, our understanding of God, our appreciation of who He is? Same thing goes into our finances. Hey, I got one that kept some of you off guard. What if we actually express to God through a spirit of gratitude for all of His goodness in our church instead of focusing on the semantics that sometimes annoy us within a church? There be standing ovation, blah, blah, blah. Thank you, baby. Jesus is great. Apparently, I struck a nerve. It all, folks, all of this in the study from Berkeley. See, every study out there says your brain will change if you start listing what you're grateful for. Literally, your brain will lower the amount of cortisol that's going through your body. How many of you know what cortisol is? So, in a nutshell, cortisol is, in essence, the hormone that produces the fight or flight. 
uh, mentality that most of us have in stressful situations. So these studies, here's what, they, here's what they're actually talking about. So cortisol is that fight or flight hormone in our body. Well, when you get anxious, like for instance this week, Thanksgiving, your mother-in-law comes to your house and she criticizes that your church is too dry and your pumpkin pie is not right, and you have a fight or flight attitude, practice this. When you get anxious, you have that fight or flight control. Here's what uh, cortisol raises up, those things in your body. Now, unfortunately, there is a side effect of cortisol in your body and the unleashing of too much of it. it is the, the side effect of cortisol in your body is this. It causes you to gain belly fat. And that belly fat produced by cortisol actually, actually goes on to make your liver fatter, it makes your pancreas fatter, it makes your gallbladder fatter, and it makes your heart fatter. See, that heart disease you get from cortisol is what's killing you. See, folks, it's your lack of gratitude is making you fat around the middle and putting you in the grave. It's not the gravy. <laughs> it's not the pumpkin pie. It's your attitude that's killing you. Now, some of you are going, hey, wait a minute, David. Fun and game's good, but have, have you taken a look around the culture? Is it actually appropriate to talk about gratitude? Especially in a little bit of a humorous way, with all the stuff that's going on in our culture. Like, for instance, David, are you not aware that this week was the 11th shooting in a public school this year where two students were killed and three more were wounded? David, are you not aware that in across the United States, so far, as we stand here in this room this morning, there have been 23 mass shootings in the United States? David, are you not aware that there are still wildfires burning in Southern California? And even as we here in the Phoenix area are moving into Thanksgiving and having a great time because everybody in the country is going to be jealous of our weather because there stinks. It was just a year ago that Northern California had the wildfires that literally burned cities to the ground and those people still don't have homes and have not reached insurance settlements. David, are you naive? David, are you not aware that while we were sleeping last night in anticipation of coming to Connect Church for worship, there was a sheriff in Alabama who responded to a domestic call, had his car stolen, and the victim shot and killed the sheriff? David, the holidays aren't my favorite time of the year. If we're going to be honest, David, there's a lot of stress in our family. I dread some of the holiday things. David, how can you talk about gratitude? Here's what I want you to hear loud and clear, folks. Here's what I believe the Bible is saying. Here's what I believe science is proving today that the Bible is saying in your life and mine. The times we need to be strongest in thanksgiving in a spirit of thankfulness are the times when it's hardest to figure out what we're thankful for. That's why Paul said that it is the peace of God that transcends all understanding in verse number 7. It's gratitude, folks, this season, in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of your frustration, in the midst of your concerns, in the midst of the fact that some of us are going to eat a little bit too much this week, let gratitude make you stronger. And it will bind the cortisol. It will be fine next Sunday. <laughs> Second thought is this. Let love make you significant. Now, when I'm talking about love here, I'm not talking about the emotion of love. I'm talking about the focus of love, the discipline of love. You see, it's all about the attitude, the mindset of what it means to put other people first. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we pop that scripture up. There's this verse 2. But many of you know that in 1 Corinthians is kind of called the love chapter. You hear it read about three out of every four weddings and stuff like that. But here's the deal. Paul's not actually talking about the emotion of love. Paul's not talking about that feeling that you have. Paul's actually talking about a focus or an intent or a... a um, Here's what Paul's saying. Paul is saying, without love, paraphrase, whole 1 Corinthians 13, without love, you will lead a life 
beneath your purpose. Paul's talking about the discipline of love. You would lead a life without your purpose. Here's the question, folks, every one of us has to answer. We're, we're eight or eighty in this room this morning. Do you want to actually get to the end and say, I didn't really do anything with my life? I have no significance. And by the way, the opposite, opposite of that is also true. No matter what your age in life, no matter what your stage in life, no matter your position or your title or your lack thereof, if you choose love, you become a person who has powerful influence. Let me give you an example. Church I was working at a few years ago, we were doing kind of like this missions uh, dinner kind of thing. The room was pretty full. We had tables spread all over and like, well, like this church right there. Hey, good day though. Almost, you guys must have been here. The divisions are thought we were starting that free breakfast this week. First Sunday in January. And there seems to be people in the front row. Now I forgot where I was going. Oh, um, so the room was full. We had tables and stuff. And so people kind of go from the back first. And we had a, a special speaker come in. Uh, from uh, out of the country, and she was addressing uh, sex trafficking and, and need and stuff like that. And sitting at the table right in front of the speaker was a family, and they had like their seven or eight year old son with them. Now, how many of you know that kids, even good kids, even the most well intentioned kids, don't always have a sense of self consciousness, a sense, a filter, right? And this family's sitting there, and the speaker's talking, and this lady comes in just a little bit late. And she comes up and takes what is essentially the only seat left there in the room, right beside that little kid. And the lady only has one arm. And the little kid, without a filter, looks at her and says, Lady, you only have one arm. Now this is all while the speaker's going on. She can actually kind of hear this. And the lady looks and she said, yeah, she said, several years ago, I was in a really, really terrible accident. And while I lost my arm, I didn't lose my life, and I'm doing pretty well. No people, oh, okay. Because kids don't have, you know, don't have a whisper either. <laughs> so the, the speaker keeps on going, and she keeps on talking. And true to form in our church, when, when, when speakers at that point, when speakers would make uh, really, really valid points that had a little bit of emotion and, and connected, the church would burst into applause. And she's talking about sex trafficking, some of the things we're involved in. And she hits one of those moments in, in her speech where, true to form, our church burst into applause and standing ovation. Well, this little kid realizes this lady can't clap. And before anything, anybody can do anything, he grabs her good arm and starts clapping it with one of his hands. <laughs> Now you gotta be exactly right. The kid gets it. Right? The kid gets it. He's there clapping with that, and the speaker sees that. And when everything dies down, the speaker kind of veers off script for just a second, and here's what she says, literally what she says. She looks at this table, that little boy and that lady with one arm, and she says, God is using his broken people to applaud his broken people that he is using to put the world back together again. All because of the significance of love, because of an attitude that understands. Folks, the kid got it, right? See, when, when we love, we make a difference. And my encouragement to you this morning is do not let cynicism get into your heart because it is a root that is hard to get rid of. That's why here at Connect Church, we practice unleashing compassion so much, and it shows up in about two out of every three messages that I'm sharing. This holiday season, every single one of us in here can choose to make a difference and help change someone's life. For instance, just for instance, what if... We love each other and our community with the same level of passion we put into Black Friday shopping. Now, now think about it. On Black Friday, here's what happens. If you're under 40, you spend hours online reading all the digital uh, ads and seeing who's got the best door busters. And some of them are even starting on Thanksgiving night, which I hate because I'm a traditionalist and the only place in my life where I practice that, that 
And, and, then, and then if you're over 40, you get the newspaper on Thanksgiving Day and go through it all. And then what happens is you look at all the ones you want to go to, and then you call your best friend, and you convince them to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning with you on Thanksgiving Day, put on some really comfortable clothes, and go out and stand in line for 45 minutes of what we call cold. <laughs> Good, you got that one, didn't you? <laughs> and then they open the doors and you push a bunch of people over to run in and get whatever it was you saw that you had to have for Black Friday shopping. I mean, I've already done some work for you. Like, for instance, right here. Go to the next slide. Target's Black Friday ad, 2019. A bunch of you are going to get up in the back. A bunch of you are going to get up and you're going to go buy that 65-inch TV that has UHD, VHD, and is 4K, whatever that means. <laughs> Sounds like a marathon to me. I'm not interested. <laughs> but you're going to get up, and you're going to go do that stuff, right? You're going to get whatever you can. And they open at 5 o'clock on Thursday. What if... We put that level of effort, some of you are going, hey David, can I get that when you're done? <laughs> <laughs> what if we put that level of effort that we put into Black Friday shopping, into loving the people inside this church, into loving our community, into reaching out and making a difference? What would that look like? See, here's my, part of my struggle. We want to change but we don't want to accept the challenge of change. In fact, nowhere in our lives is this more evident than the issue of gaining and losing weight. Because I also know how this works. Starting next week, we're going to allow ourselves to eat freely for the next five weeks or six weeks, right on through New Year. And then we're going to spend the whole month of January joining a gym that we're never going to use after February. <laughs> so that we can deal with the average 5.3 pounds that the average American gains over this holiday season. But we don't we want to we want to have the change in our lives. We don't want to accept the challenge of how the discipline to actually lose the weight or to maybe push back one spoonful earlier each meal over the next five weeks. Now here's the good news. It's not just us and it's not just 21st century. In fact, here's an ad from a couple of decades ago about how you could do that. Reduce your flesh by wearing rubber garments. <laughs> the ad literally says that if you wear rubber garments, it will eat away your excess fat and flesh. And then down the bottom, you can't see it. But it even says that for an extra $7, you can get the neck and chin bands that will make them magically disappear. <laughs> right? Why? Because... We, this is hilarious. <laughs> because we want to change without having to live through the challenge. How many of you have seen this next ad? Weight loss secrets. No diet, no exercise. That's actually the cover of a book. Because we want to lose the weight, but we don't want to have to diet. God forbid we'd actually go to the gym. We don't want to have to exercise. But here, now there's a subliminal message in this ad that tells you how you can lose the weight without diet and exercise. Apparently, all you have to do is carry around about a 35 pound scale, and every flight of steps you go up with, you're burning extra calories, right? <laughs> but what if we could do the easy part? Like, for instance, how many of you would love if you could do a diet like this one? The ice cream diet. <laughs> but you know that's actually, you know, Hagen Dawes is your friend, right? <laughs> the ice cream diet. Or some of you, you like a little different. How about this diet? The pizza diet. It says, tells you how you can use pizza to reduce your body mass and lose weight. Now here's what I'm thinking. After you've got that rubber garment, and after you've eaten all the ice cream and ice cream diet, and after you've eaten all the pizza and the pizza diet, you're going to leave the taco cleanse. <laughs> <laughs> now, 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 check it out. See the words, the promise, proven to change your life. I'm going to change your life, all right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I love you enough to tell you the truth. There is no easy way to lose weight. You have to burn more calories than you take in, period. See, we want the change, 
without challenge. And the same thing in our lives. And it's love that makes us significant. And love primarily is not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It's an attitude that begins with a spirit of gratitude. So far, so good. Here's our third thought today. Let sacrifice make you blessed. Sacrifice is the attitude that creates the real change that we were just talking about. And folks, there is no change in life without sacrifice. I firmly believe that we are blessed in part so that we can give to others who are struggling. I do not believe in a give-to-get mindset. I do not believe in a, a theology of prosperity that if I give, then I'll get. But here's what I know. When you give, you get. When you live in the Spirit, here's what happens. Transformational change happens all around you. If you always live for you, You'll never live at all. Transformational change happens all around because it first happens within. How many of you know John 3.16? For God so... Okay, that's enough, you know. How many of you know 1 John 3.16? 1 John 3.16. This is how we know what love is. Okay, so here's the understanding. The Bible is giving us God's definition of love, okay? That Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. That's the biblical definition of love. That Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for brothers and sisters. See, Jesus is teaching us that we have been blessed. And part of the reason that we are so blessed is because he wants to utilize the blessing in our lives that we honor him and take care of others. Jesus is teaching us what real life is. And if you live for yourself, you're just not alive. One of the problems in the United States is the American church. See, one of the problems in the United States is the American church is not holding up its end of the deal. Some American people have to look to the government or other organizations to do things that God intended for his church to do. And so there's a, that's part of the reason there's such a mess in Phoenix and Sacramento and Columbus and Washington. Here's my personal conviction. This isn't in the blood. Well, actually, it's in the Bible. You have to find it for yourself. One reason I'm so big on serving our community, one reason I'm so big on unleashing compassion and my conviction, if Christians were doing their part so the church could fully do its part, the United States wouldn't need welfare. If Christians were doing their part, that enabled and facilitated the church to do its part, the United States wouldn't need welfare. Now, we can't change that. That's one of those certain things. But here's what burns in my heart when I think about us, when I pray about us, when I hold up cards and talk about year in giving. I envision the day in this church, in this fellowship, when some of our seniors who are li living on the limits of Social Security that is not keeping up with the cost of living and inflation, would never have to worry about where their next meal is coming from. Would never have to worry about where the rent's being paid because this church is so generous and so gracious they know we always have their backs. Yeah. Where a family, say a single mom who's come through a tough time or whatever the circumstance, is doing their best to get ahead, that life keeps beating them down, but we are blessed that we are able to give, that this church has such a spirit of generosity and such a spirit of giving that we've got written into our budget hundreds of thousands of dollars that we can use to minister to the needs of the families within this congregation, maybe within the 85205. We can't change the lack of welfare, but we can change the impact of this congregation and the impact of this neighborhood and the impact of this zip code. Some of you know that over the years I've done some work, some travels, literally have raised millions of dollars for an organization called Compassion International. Compassion International actually started the first iteration of it did about 67 years ago when a Baptist pastor by the name of Everett Swanson. That's your grandpa. <laughs> yeah, 
just checking. You love compassion. I'm just wondering. Eric Swanson was a pastor, a Baptist pastor, and during the Korean War, he actually went on a missions trip to Korea. He went over there with the understanding of what he was going to do. Is he was going to go minister to the troops. He was going to provide some encouragement to them, some Bible studies that would help inspire them. He was going to pray for them, pray for their families. And he was over there to do that. And after finishing one day what he was doing, he just, it was a cold day, and he just started going out and walking through the city. It was a cold day, but it wasn't freezing cold, and he actually had his coat draped over his arm. And as he went walking through the city, he found himself venturing into some slum areas. He saw this little kid, about eight or nine years old, come walking towards him. Now, he thought that the kid was going to come up and ask him for a handout. And so as the kid got closer, he kind of leaned into him, and when he did, the kid grabbed his coat and ran off. He stole his coat. So Pastor Swanson starts chasing the kid through the slums. And he gets lost and he's weaving around and can't find the kid. But as he comes around the corner there on this little shanty, he finds his coat kind of like hanging there. And when he pulls back his coat, laying underneath it was this kid. And as he steps inside the shanty and looks around, there were a dozen other kids who were orphans because their parents had been killed in the war. And they were laying in there freezing to death and starving to death. What he did is he went down to the street and found a little storefront. He went in and bought a bunch of hot soup and a bunch of blankets and took them back and spent the rest of the day with those 10 or 12 kids. Somehow he found his way out of that and back to his hotel. He thought about it and prayed about it all night. He got up early the next morning. It's still kind of misty and foggy because the cold and the heat are like messing things up. And he's trying to find his way back to find that machine to find his kids, but he can't find his way back. But as he comes around this corner, through, through the, the, like, the mist and stuff, he, he sees this, like, these carts and these trucks, and they're dumping garbage in it. He looks a little closer, and he gets a little closer, and then he's like, well, they're not just dumping garbage. They're dumping bundles of rags. And he gets a little closer, and then his heart sank, and he nearly vomited when he realized that the garbage wasn't really rags. It was actually the dead bodies of children who had died overnight from exposure. And this wasn't the only block. As a matter of fact, he followed this for the next couple of days. Every day, every morning, thousands of kids were being thrown into dumpsters who had died from exposure and hunger the night before. So we went back to the United States. He called every pastor he had any kind of relationship with, every church he had any kind of relationship, every friend or family member, and they sponsored like a, just what he could do, like 125 kids right there. That's how Compassion got started. As a matter of fact, today, through Compassion International, 125,000 kids accept Jesus every year because of that ministry. 125,000 kids say yes to Jesus every year because of that ministry. Now, I'm representing this ministry. It's gotten on in my heart. And so, in fact, I was just online this past week paying my sponsorship of Faustina. Faustina is now 19. Tammy and I adopted her when she was 10. And we will continue to sponsor her until she either gets married or until she turns 25 or she goes to college. We exchanged the letters and stuff and the pictures, and it's been kind of cool watching her grow up. A year ago, I was uh, speaking at a conference, and uh, they asked me to do one of the compassion talks. And one of the things I do is I go out and I pick up a little packet. And I use it just to hold up and explain, hey, here's how this works, and here's what it costs. And, you know, if you go get a packet, make sure you turn it back in, because if you lose that packet, compassion has no record to see if that kid is adopted or not. It can take them a better part of a year to figure it out, and that kid will go unsponsored. Well, after the session got over, I was busy talking to people and doing stuff. And it was like now 11 o'clock at night, but you know what? It was there. And I'm walking back through the auditorium. I'm holding that packet. I'm like, I better get this back out to the compassion table. And as I did, I looked at it. There was four year old Stanley in Kenya. Well, I've been to Kenya twice and probably going to end up going again on their behalf. And it just gripped my heart. So I took a picture of it and sent it to Tammy and said, I just think God wants us to sponsor this kid. He was a cool little dude in his t-shirt. His, his, uh, you know, he had it on like his claw hoppers. That's what they call them right from. <laughs> so I put the thing out, turned it in, and started sponsoring Stanley. And that was two years ago. Last year about this time, I went online and paid my sponsorship. And 
Dave Faustina and wrote her a letter like I always do. I couldn't find his family. Like, first name? So I called for passion. Hey, my kid's missing. He said, well, let us call you back. So somebody called me back, and here's what they explained. They were still getting the details, but about two days before, his family foraging for food, just finding something to eat. The little boy that I had been exchanging correspondence with, who wanted to grow up and become a professional soccer player, and I used to encourage him to watch the World Cup so they could get TV at like a little internet cafe where he lived. He's foraging for food, got some bad food, and died of poison. It broke my heart. I asked for passion if I could contact his family, and they said that'd be fine. And that we're not doing a compassion thing this morning. This is just me talking to you about a, a spirit of thanksgiving, a spirit of thanksgiving, a spirit of gratitude. And make sure I know it's to your heart. I actually promise you, no later than this Sunday of next year. And if God will allow before you graduate, we'll do a compassion service here at Connect. Would that be okay with you? Would that be okay with you? Please. Okay. But I couldn't help but think of when we were here for our vision dessert last Sunday afternoon and Hannah Skyped in from Slovenia and Hannah talked about what she's trying to do to reach teenagers in that part of the world. And through that big smile and generous personality part of hers, we got to see her heart and, and how hard that is. And that, you know, our church has a commitment that we will give her a minimum of $300 a month. When we first sponsored her, we had pledges of $400. Some of us may have lost track of that pledge. If you could pick it back up, it's only $20 a month. 15 people giving $20 a month. I write mine for Sunday of every month. So we can provide for her. And then here's what's really cool. Uh, I, a few weeks ago, I got involved in starting up a new connection group here at on Sunday afternoons. A bunch of 20 year olds in it. I have no place to be in there. <laughs> the very first week, we started talking about what we were going to do as a compassion project between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Then last week, as we started narrowing the focus, check this out. This is so cool. This is stuff burning on my heart, but these folks didn't know it. We decided the Sunshine Acres. That works as a children's home, so to speak, just down the street from us. That works with children and teenagers who are orphaned, not unlike Everett Swanson doing in Korea. It's going to be our project. You researched it this week, right? We're ready to make this happen. If you guys want to piggyback with us, that's fine, let us know. But our group's going to do some compassion stuff with them throughout the Christmas season. But here's the question. When it comes to the spirit of gratitude, when it comes to the benefits of a, an attitude of thanksgiving in your life, what are you going to do? Not just this week, not just this month, not just in Christmas. What are you going to do with the one and only life God's given you this side of eternity? See, it's one thing for us to be a church that teaches the Bible. Well, you've already affirmed that we're a church that teaches the Bible, right? It's one thing for us to be a group of people, a fellowship, a congregation who go into our groups and into our homes and sit around our kitchen tables and study the Bible and read the Bible. But it's quite another thing for us to walk out those doors and live the Bible. See, when you fall in love with Jesus, you fall in love with the idea of serving Him. And when you decide that you're going to do life with Jesus, that means you're going to love like Jesus, that you're going to lay down your life for others. You're going to walk with Him and serve with Him. And you're going to treat people like he did. Here's the understanding. Bottom line, it's not your notes. Write it in. Attitude becomes everything when it leads to action. You can have the softest heart. You can have the most graceful spirit. You can say the nicest and kindest things. But attitude only becomes everything when it leads to action. And so, Father... As we literally go into six weeks that we call in our country the most wonderful time of the year, not for the reasons I said last week, what do you want to do with our attitudes individually, collectively, 
as a congregation and as a fellowship. God, would you teach us this week, literally this week, on what it means to live a life that embraces the spirit of thanksgiving, that embraces an attitude of gratitude. Maybe every day this week, as just a way to start, we send one email, make one phone call, buy one cup of coffee to someone and just let them know how much we appreciate them. Maybe in our prayers this week, we decided every prayer this week is going to focus on your goodness and your blessing and not our complaints and our concerns. God, what about the way we treat other people? The mindset with which we approach things in our jobs, in our households, in this church? We can have a spirit of appreciation. Or we can have a spirit of resentment and bitterness. When we walk into our office, when we walk into a crowded restaurant, when somebody complains about our cooking on Thursday, when somebody's pushing us in the line at 4 o'clock in the morning outside of Walmart on Friday, we get to choose, God. We get to choose. Attitude is everything when it leads to action. And so God, we love you, we honor you, we worship you, we thank you. Thank you for leading us to 5255 East Brown Road. Thank you for the provision that God has into this space. Thank you for the effort that was provided to the people who allowed us to get into this space. Thank you for our connection groups and our connection group leaders. Thank you for our staff and the people who work with our children and with hospitality and with technology and with music and, and with our Bible studies. Thank you, God, for your son, Jesus the Christ, who's preparing a place for me that I can go and dwell with him. We are blessed. You are good. You are God. And we give you our lives. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Everybody say it with me. Amen. Hey, folks, have a great Thanksgiving. We'll see you next Sunday. God bless you.